Next speaker is Professor Amir Ali Popper from University of Queensland, Australia. So, as Associate Professor Amir Ali Popper is a NHMRC Fellow and Director of Research at the University of Queensland School of Pharmacy. He has a PhD from Australian Institute of Bioengineering and Nanotechnology in 2012. Dr. Popert has a Bachelor of Pharmacy from KBIPER and Master of Pharmaceutics from LMCP and has research interest in advanced drug delivery and nanomedicine. He has published over 45 journal articles and have three patents in his name. His group has received more than $6 million of funding in the past five years. He is also the current, he is also the current pres president of Australian Control Release Society and academic bo uh, board member of the CRS focus group on nanoscale delivery. He is also an advisory board member of many journals such as Pharmaceutics, DDTR and Nanoscale Horizon. So with this, I invite Professor Ahmed to give his talk. Over to you, Professor Ahmed. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Deepak, and uh, thank you to Professor Jada for the kind invitation. Um, are you able to see my whole screen? Yes, yeah, you can put it on the full uh, view mode. Okay, all right. Okay, this is visible, right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so um, thank you all for um, joining for this um, excellent conference that has been so far. Um, so um, today, um, what I'll talk a little bit about is one of the technologies that we are using currently in our lab. Um, my lab um, is um, uh, situated at the School of Pharmacy, University of Queensland, Australia. And um, we particularly are interested in uh, development of new materials or synthesizing new materials for drug delivery. Um, we do work with traditional liposomes, uh, PLGA type materials, but I think the major focus on of the lab has been for the past five to seven years is to develop develop a new new type of material. And one of those new type of material um, is silica based nanoformulations. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So before I start, um, I, I really like this, um, the uh, the, the, this paper from Robert Langer's in, in General American Chemical Society, JAX, in 2016, um, sort of re, re highlighting the need of um, how the traditionally the drug delivery technologies were made and, and what is the role of um, uh, the new entities, new chemical entities, or the biologicals, or, um, you know, those um, interferon alpha type molecules, immunotherapeutic drugs, um, and, and how the drug delivery has sort of evolved. Um, this is a quite traditional um, graph, BCS classification, and majority of you are aware of this classification, uh, which sort of talks about um, poor permeability, poor solubility of small molecules, uh, and major, not more than 90% of those newly synthesized molecules are either poorly soluble or poorly permeable or both. Um, however, only less than 1% of the biologics can be delivered orally. And even that 1% of biologics that can be delivered orally, the bioavailability is very, very poor. Um, so again, um, uh, if we think about the traditionally how the drugs um, were formulated is uh, using this control release technology, such as reservoir type polymers, uh, degradable materials, erodible materials, um, osmotic pump, um, and, you know, um, hydrogels. Uh, when osmotic pump and hydrogels um, came into the market, it, it, was a, it was a very big thing, and it sort of solved problems of the drugs at the time very rapidly. Um, hydrogels were then also popular in wound healing and other applications as well. Um, but, but this article from Robert Langer also talks about um, the evolving role of drug delivery in, in a way that the new molecules that are being synthesized, the biologics that are being developed, um, peptides, proteins, um, uh, you know, immunotherapeutic agents, um, how do we deliver them? So it talks about thinking outside the box and thinking about new materials rather than keep using existing materials. Um, uh, certainly one where to do that is modifying or improving on existing materials. And, uh, you know, Professor Lee has given a very um, important example of liposomes and the drug loading in the liposome has been uh, an issue and how they've been able to solve that problem. So that's excellent. Um, uh, 
in terms of getting that into the market because liposomes are, you know, there's a history there and um, majority of the nanomedicine product um, are liposome based products uh, that are in the market um, for cancer. And so when we started designing those materials, we wanted to think about the challenges that there are already there and what is out there. So uh, first of all, if we think about the challenges, the challenges are um, your salivary enzymes, um, as soon as you take the tablet orally or capsule orally or patch or uh, oral dispersible formulations, and then it goes to the stomach where there's pepsin and the pH is really, really, um, you know, pH um, is a problem as well. Um, and, and then, um, and then uh, when the formulations are uh, going to uh, colon, um, uh, those formulations are uh, then degraded by your enzymes and, uh, and then, you know, permeability also an issue. If you focus here um, uh, on the mucus barrier, so after the formulation has passed the stomach, in the small intestine, mucus barrier is a major barrier. Um, and um, that mucus barrier not only stops the uh, you know, bacteria, then pathogens to enter the body, so that's really great, but also stops the molecules um, and some of the drugs that are not permeable um, and, and you know, sort of stops the... Um, uh, prevent them to be orally available. Uh, so various strategies have been designed that um, you have a mucus penetrating nanoparticles, so you put hydrophilic polymers, such as, excuse me, polyethylene glycol or polyethylene glycol derivatives. Uh, you also have um, mucoadhesive patches um, that you could use. Um, so mucoadhesin has also been um, uh, another approach where you use chitosan or positively charged polymers. Um, enzyme inhibition is, um, you know, very interestingly used um, by um, this orally available um, semaglutide um, formulation that has been recently approved. Um, that technology uses um, a, a small molecule enzyme inhibitor called SNAC, and that actually uh, um, increases the pH in the stomach uh, and allows the semaglutide to be absorbed while inactivating the enzyme that actually degrades it. So that's another strategy that has been used to improve the oral delivery. Uh, paracellular transport, so opening the tight junction um, uh, in the gut transiently um, and allowing the molecule to pass through uh, one of the challenges there might be that when you open the tight junction, other pathogens might also attack the body. Uh, but if you carefully do that, um, that's also another interesting strategy. Transcellular transport is an active transport mechanism where your um, carrier um, actually takes your drug through uh, into the epithelial cell via endocytosis and then exocytosis into the bloodstream. Um, and in terms of the um, uh, skin-based delivery or, you know, taking molecules through the skin into the bloodstream, uh, microneedles have been also used. However, if you look at these um, traditionally used systems, um, uh, there are several disadvantages of these systems. And one of the disadvantages, you know, premature drug release. Um, and a typical example of that is PLGA. Um, PLGA has been used um, for many decades now. However, um, still the loading capacity and the premature drug release are the two major issue. Another issue is that a lot of these polymers um, are also um, prone to solvent degradation. So if you want to modify the PLG and nanoparticles with several different functionalities, um, it is very difficult um, to do that unless you uh, design those functionality into the monomers or um, uh, it is certainly possible slightly more with liposomes, but with PLG and or type polymer nanoparticles, very difficult. Um, some of the lipid-based formulation um, are prone to acid degradation. Um, some of the lipids that uh, Professor Lee mentioned are not, so they, there is an improvement there. Um, again, low drug loading capacity of the liposome is, is an issue, which, um, you know, uh, Dr. Lee and their labs have been able to um, sort of um, sort of uh, tackle, um, but burst release. So um, if you look at the release profile from the liposomes, um, it, it is very rapid. Um, the liposomes or the lipid-based uh, SMED type formulations are able to improve the solubility. They are able to improve the uh, dissolution. But as soon as you put them into the um, uh, media or as soon as they are in the gut, they will solubilize the drug. 
Now, that's not a problem. Sometimes you want a drug to be released in a control manner. Other times, the drug that is completely solubilized may also start to re-precipitate. So you see a burst um, biological effect, and that is followed by crystallization of the drug inside the body because it's, you know, um, dumped as a, you know, uh, uh, in the in the body that way, and that that can be a challenge. Um, and and you know, solid particles um, such as um, gold, silver, they have a great use in um, diagnosis. They're great use in as an antimicrobial agents. But um, when typically when you talk about delivering anti-malarial drug, antibiotics, or anti-inflammatory drugs these nanoparticles are not that great because the amount of nanoparticle you require to be given to the patient um, will exceed uh, uh, the toxicity limit of those. So there's a need to formulate bioresponsive nanoparticle which possess high drug loading capacity. So I'm talking between 10 and 25% by weight. I'm not talking about 25% of the encapsulation efficiency, but I'm talking about 25% by weight. So one gram of my formulation should contain 200 to 250 milligram of active drug. Um, that can improve the solubility. Um, you, can, um, you can tailor them to control the release of the drug. They should be biodegradable like liposomes and PLGA, and, and that should provide site-specific oral delivery. Um, fortunately, in my during my PhD um, um, in 2011 and 12, what we were working with is mesoporous silicon nanoparticles. Now, these nanoparticles are inorganic nanoparticles discovered by Mobil, um, uh, oil company, uh, and that was mainly discovered for catalysis. Um, they are very interesting candidates um, because they have very high surface area. They the particle size can be tuned, pore size can be tuned. And the use of silica in um, tableting industry is is not new. Uh, it has been used, um, aerosil has been used as a tableting excipients um, since many, many decades. Um, now, the figure on the right actually tells you that um, um, how um, easy it is to functionalize them, put different drugs, put the antibody. You can functionalize them with quantum dots, iron oxide nanoparticles, peptides, polymers, lipids. Uh, surface functionalization, you can load plasmid DNA, you can encapsulate sRNA, you can put aptamer, and the particles can actually cross the many, many membranes and barriers as well. So how do we synthesize them? So um, for those of you who are working in the oral drug delivery or um, cancer-based nanomedicine, uh, synthesis of silica nanoparticles is actually very, very simple. Um, what you need to think about is think about a fundamental chemistry. So when you have a surfactant, um, all surfactants have critical micelle concentration. So at the critical micellar concentration, those surfactants will self-assemble. And once they self-assemble, the shape of the micelle, the size of the micelle um, will determine the final morphology. But what you can do is you can change that by changing the parameters such as pH, the amount of surfactant, the type of surfactant, a solvent, um, and then you add a different types of silica source that can um, have an impact on the morphology. So once you add the silica source, such as the trithalotosilicate or its derivatives, it will start to uh, react with those surfactants on the surface. And then um, this, it, will, it will polymerize and condense um, to form this thick wall uh, outside those surfactants. Now, if you remove the surfactant or selectively etch the surfactant, what you will get is actually a pores. And now those pores are not pores that are uh, physically done. They are done at a molecular level and the size and the shape of the pore is exactly the same for the whole sample. How do they look? So if you see on the left, um, the spherical particle has a cubic pore. So each tiny dot that you see here is actually cubic shape, and the pore size is between 3 to 5 nanometer. Um, the right-hand side, MCM41, has a cylindrical pore, and that's why you can see the, uh, the angle, um, uh, it, the, the, it goes in the angle and goes in the, in the cylindrical side. Um, and, and those, the particle size, as you can see, is about 100 nanometer for both of these. And these, these are the, one of the two most widely used. Um, third one is SBF15, two most, three most widely used silica uh, in oral drug delivery. 
but you can do a lot of different things. So uh, we have been able to make um, fiber-like structures, uh, very tiny little large pore silica particles, about 30 nanometer that we're using for um, you know, glioblastoma delivery. We also have popcorn-like um, particle structure. So you can surface, uh, induce the surface roughness. Now the surface roughness uh, provides the additional ability of these particles to be taken up by cells. Like for example, viruses have surface roughness. They have a surface protein that provides the surface roughness. Uh, and this virus-like structure is shown here. So this is actually a silica which has sort of like these um, fiber-like structure outside that allows them to be taken up by cells more efficiently. A lot of people ask me, okay, um, how safe is this? Um, particularly when given orally, um, silica or colloidal silica has been used um, uh, in nutraceutical industry since decades. So for example, well, your sensodyne has silicon dioxide. Uh, your um, nutraceutical tablets, for example, this tablet that they sell in, in Australia has 300 milligram of silica per capsule. And you need to take three capsules a day. So um, it, it has been used orally and it has been um, you know, approved or, for oral use in tableting industry for decades. There are many clinical trials um, going on at the moment using um, silica nanoparticles. So the future seems bright. Um, however, the challenge is to get the right formulation for the right problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some examples um, of our formulations, the silica particles um, that we have um, tried to improve the solubility, permeability, delivery efficiency, site-specific delivery, uh, of many, many molecules. So first example is this resveratrol. It's a polyphenol um, uh, compound uh, from red wine or peanuts. Uh, it is anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory. Problem is very poor solubility. Um, permeability is okay. Um, so what we did is we took um, MCM48 type of silica, and then we encapsulated um, that silica into these particles with 30% by weight loading efficiency. So we were able to load up to 300 milligram of this drug into one gram of silica particles. Now, how did we achieve that? So the loading um, mechanism or the loading um, efficiency or the capacity is so high is because what we do is we also use a solvent approach. So what we do is we dissolve the drug in the choice of solvent. So in this case, methanol, and uh, we impregnate the... Uh, soluble drug with the silica nanoparticles. Now, what happens is that due to capillary force, that solvent goes inside those tiny little nanopores, and then we um, evaporate the solvent under reduced pressure. Now, when we evaporate the solvent, um, what happens is um, the drug precipitates within those tiny nanopores. And when it precipitates and stays in those tiny nanopores, it will not be able to recrystallize. So crystal growth is actually diminished or reduced or the kinetics is slowed down. And because of that, um, you have a drug in an amorphous state and that amorphous state drug um, is giving you, you know, improved solubility, improved dissolution in this case. Um, as you can see here from this X-ray diffraction graph, um, the resveratrol is very crystalline. When you physically mix resveratrol with silica, you still see those crystalline peaks, but when you encapsulate using our technology, then it doesn't show any extra, uh, um, doesn't show any uh, crystalline peaks. So what we did then is um, we checked that what if we uh, look at the anti-inflammatory activity. So these are macrophages that have uh, uh, that are reporter cells for NF kappa B. So they have a GFP tag on them, and when um, the inflammation is high, so when you treat them with lipopolysaccharide. Uh, the cells light up green because the green fluorescent protein is going to release um, when there is more inflammation. So, um, so GFP percentage about fifty percent GFP percentage when you treat them with um, resveratrol solution. So, in this case, the solution means that resveratrol was um, uh, dissolved in one percent DMSO and then diluted. Um, the suspension is just um, undissolved drug and then silica loaded resveratrol. And as you can see, the silica loaded resveratrol has much better efficacy in terms of reducing the end of kappa B compared to even solution um, or suspension. 
Another example is Verinostat. Uh, Verinostat is an HDEC inhibitor used in cancer. Um, it is orally available. Uh, the dose of Verinostat is 100 milligram tablet uh, four times a day. Um, a very poor solubility, poor permeability. It's a business class four drug. So if you look at these particles here on the left, um, the beauty of this is that, as you can see, each and individual particle has exactly the same structure. They have exactly the same pore structure, and the pores are really, really highly ordered. And, and that is the, the important thing, that each and every particle behaves the same when you load. So what we did is we loaded Varunastat onto the particle and suddenly we saw a spike in the solubility. That solubility was further increased when we have amino functionalization. That was further increased when we have phosphonate functionalization. And that, that also, um, these formulations also increase the permeability of the Varunastat as well. Here's another example where um, we, we were able to um, we were able to um, use a um, uh, floating tablet using silicon nanoparticles. We were able to make floating tablets. So the idea was that, um, can we release the drug in the stomach? And we used two drugs, Keptopril as a water soluble molecule and curcumin as a water insoluble molecule. And um, uh, the, the drug was loaded using our solvent technology um, uh, into the mesoporous silicon nanoparticles. Then it was mixed with HPMC. The polymer here is HPMC. We added sodium bicarbonate and we just did the direct compression. Now, the, the surprising thing was that we were able to compress those tablets without having any issues uh, in flowability or anything because the silica itself is directly compressible. And that's, a, that's really great. Uh, you can see the tablets are looking very nice. Um, and then we tested the in vitro release using the, the, the in vitro model. So as you can see, all four formulations are actually floated, um, the way able to float, excuse me, up to 20 hours. Um, one of the things to note is that there are two release graphs here. The one on the left, F1 to F4, the F1 is able to improve the solubility and dissolution of the curcumin, uh, whereas the other formulation are not. The, the thing to notice here is that F1 is the only formulation that has got 1.7 nanometer pore size. So here what we're trying to show is that you can tune the pore size and that tuning of the pore size can have an impact on the dissolution. So not every single pore size is going to be good for a particular drug. So if you load curcumin exactly the same way using 2.1 nanometer pores, you don't see a lot of improvement in the solubility. However, or dissolution, however, when you have 1.7 nanometer pore size, you certainly see improvement in the dissolution. Now, in terms of the captopril here, F5 and F6, so F6 is the formulation that is made with captopril without using mesoborosilica. And it sort of shows you a very rapid dissolution finished at 100% um, drug release in eight hours. Whereas the mesoborosilica nanoparticles loaded captopril compressed into um, floating dosage form, shows you a 24 hour drug release. And that is really good because now what um, we are able to do is we are able to reduce the dosage. So we are able to reduce the frequency of the dose and that's really great. Here is some example of another um, method to load into mesoparasilica nanoparticles. And this is not published. This is a uh, fresh of the boat is that we've used um, uh, uh, we've used um, a supercritical um, liquid carbon dioxide, a supercritical fluid. Um, and so liquid carbon dioxide was used to dissolve the drug. And then mesoporosilica nanoparticles were added to encapsulate uh, the drug. And we were able to achieve about 30% to 35% by weight loading capacity. So uh, every gram of silica, you will have 300 to 350 milligram of the drug. And the example is an antibiotic that is um, given intravenously only meropenem uh, because um, it has a problem of the stability in the gastric fluid. And also it's a pair of PGP substrate. So its permeability is good, but then, um, you know, the efflux uh, is an issue there. So what we did is we first encapsulated um, um, using liquid CO2, um, the meropenem into silicon nanoparticles, and then um, capped with the eudrogit 
and looked at the permeability and looked at the antimicrobial activity. So permeability, as you can see on this graph on the right, A and B, uh, the permeability with silica particles and you project is much higher compared to the drug. But more importantly, the flux, efflux ratio. So the transport from B to A was also prevented um, uh, using uh, eudrogit coated um, silica particles um, that had myrrh in it. Uh, and, and that's really great. So the efflux ratio is only 0.64 compared to MERS efflux ratio of 2.72. Uh, we were also able to show that the clinical strain 23 of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, the, the, the drug that is inside these coated particles, is as active as the free drug. So we are not jeopardizing the, uh, or, or none of the drugs degraded basically. We also use exactly same technology and improve the coating ability uh, using microfluidics technology. And this is also unpublished data where we have, um, we use a liquid CO2 assisted um, loading of meropenem, and then we encapsulated those silica particles um, with microparticles. So uh, say one big microparticle of eudrogid contains many, many silica nanoparticles. And once the, the idea is that the, this, this idea where you have, um, particles coming out from one big large particles and sort of giving you a, a improved efficacy. So once you dredge it, it reaches the uh, small intestine, it will start to dissolve and it will start to sort of pop this silicon nanoparticles out as well. So we use three um, Udrajit for that. Um, so Udrajit RSPO, Udrajit RS100, and Udrajit S100. And as you can see, the first two A and B here uh, are RSPO and RS100 shows you that zero order release profile um, compared to MER. So if you use only meropenem, the drug is going to degrade in acidic environment within five minutes. But here, uh, we were able to retain about 50% of the drug, active drug, uh, in the RS100, about 60 to 70 percent, and and here as well about 40 percent. But you you can see the total drug release is very close to the active drug in all of these cases. Uh, so that's a great news. Um, if you look at this graph here, the permeability um, is also improved in case of RSPO, um, and we compared that. This this line here actually is the the uh, verapamil. So verapamil is a well-known uh, permeability enhancer. Um, and, and that's what has been used here uh, as a positive control. Um, but if you can see the flux ratio, efflux ratio, um, the efflux ratio of the Udrajit RSPO coated particles is 0.71, which is very low compared to the meropenem on its own. Of course, it is important to note that the, when you use the verapamil, the efflux ratio is 0.09, uh, and but 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 verapamil cannot be given uh, to the patient who are you know um, highly last you know the very infectious or has a say UTI or something like that. And also, it's important to note that the tear value, the transepithelial resistance with the verapamil, was significantly down, uh, and that could also lead to other pathogens entering uh, as well. But that just was used as a positive control in this uh, in this essay. Um, then we um, um, used uh, uh, the same technology um, uh, coated onto the silica particles, a pH-responsive polymer eudrogid, and used it for uh, delivery of um, anti-inflammatory molecules to the colon. Um, here's an example of prednisolone where we have uh, prednisolone, the red graph here, a water-soluble kind of, um, you know, reasonably soluble molecule, when you coat it in the silica, the solid dissolution remains the same, but when you actually coat with the eudrogid, it sort of gives you no release for the first two hours here, and then sort of slowly releases um, over time. The similar trend is was seen with the budesonide. Budesonide is also uh, one of the widely used um, corticosteroid uh, for inflammatory bowel disease, and we were able to show um, that um, that is possible uh, with our formulation as well. Then we thought that we will try this um, um, formulation um, and and um, and test it in um, uh, in vivo using a colitis model. Um, so the mice model that we used um, to start with was a DSS induced colitis. So 
mice were given normal water, healthy mice were given normal water, but the colitis group were given 1.5% DSS, so that's the dextran sodium sulfate. Uh, and at the day seven, you transfer them back to the drinking water and the treatment of the bidesonide was started at day seven and finished at day 11, and then day 12, the animal were harvested. So the idea is that um, first, um, the drug will be uh, protected from the gastric environment. It will be released in the intestinal environment. And then at the time when there is no mucus, the silica particles will passively accumulate in the inflamed region, providing that local release. Uh, and that, that's what we wanted. Um, so first thing first, uh, looking at the histology of the colon, this is the distal colon histology. Healthy control mice, you can see this um, very nice crypt architecture, uh, no ulceration, goblet cells, um, you know, um, producing mucin, epithelium is, you know, very nice. But when you look at this DSS, uh, you know, the, the crypt, crypts are gone. There's, there's, there's no crypt. Um, uh, all the goblet cells are gone. Um, you can see, I don't know if you are able to see here, but these red, red tiny dots are actually the neutrophils uh, and those neutrophil infiltration is bad and that drives the inflammation. When you're using budesonide, you see some recovery of those crypt, but you can you still see some um, you know neutrophil infiltration and ulceration and you know crypt architecture is not normal. With the silica particles um, with and without coating, uh, we saw a similar level of improvement in the histology, um, which is also seen here um, in the quantitative analysis when we when we do that. Uh, quantitative analysis. Um, it, it was better than the budesonide, but the difference between the silica particles that were coated and that were not coated was not seen. So we thought that, you know, okay, let's look at what happens at the cellular level and those chemokines and cytokines um, uh, that drives the inflammation in the gut, what happens to those. So when we look at the mRNA expression of um, interleukin 1 beta, IL-17, IL-10, um, we were able to see the difference between the coated and uncoated particles here. As you can see from DSS, um, the coated particle shows um, significantly lower level of IL-1 beta, and same with the IL-17, and same with the IL-10. Uh, in the distal colon, the trend was there for both IL-1 beta and IL-17, although it was not um, reduced significantly, but in IL-10 case, um, the, compared to DSS and compared to budesonide in the case of hydrogen-coated particle, we saw um, a significant decrease in interleukin-10. Now, interleukin-10 is a cytokine that has double-edged sword. So um, if there is inflammation, it goes up, uh, but high level of interleukin-10 can lead to anti-inflammatory activity and downstream pathway activation. So um, these, the fact that when these particles were given, the IL-10 was down is, the, is indirect measurement of uh, reduction in the inflammation. So, so far what I've told you is that we were able to load and deliver um, a variety of small molecules um, into the gastrointestinal tract using um, uh, this pH and enzyme and polymer responsive silica particles uh, quite uh, neatly. However, um, think about um, another um, issue um, that we recently discussed in this review article um, is um, this ability of silica particles to deliver biologics. Um, so in this review article, we sort of um, take this approach where we say, what are the different properties of the silica nanoparticles that can be used to not only improve the delivery of the small molecule, but say macromolecules and how do we do that? So we, we, we hypothesize here and, and, and present that the shape of the particle and the surface property of the particle is very, very important. And by changing that surface property, um, you should be able to improve the permeability and uh, stability of the macromolecules um, uh, using silicon nanoparticles. To do the same, we synthesize um, many, many types of um, a large pore silica nanoparticles um, uh, in my lab right now. Uh, and these are the three examples. So these are the uh, dendritic type particles, and these are the dual dendritic hollow silica particles. So you say the smaller pores and then there's larger pores here. 
And these are like golf ball type particles. So what are the different advantages of these particles? So highly accessible surface area, you can co-load peptides, small molecules, and these particles, um, uh, intelligent synthesis, so we use ethyl acetate as a pore expanding agent. And the last one is actually very interesting. Um, one of my PhD students currently working on it. Um, look at the loading capacity of um, the IgG. So immunoglobulin G loading capacity is um, close to 650 microgram per milligram. So that's 65% uh, uh, loading capacity for such a large uh, antibody. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, so this is how we synthesize them. So what you have is you have a base and then you use surfactant and at 60 degree, you add an organic solvent, in this case, chlorobenzene um, and add your silica source. So what happens is that those micelles will be swollen using this um, chlorobenzene um, and those swollen micelles um, then form a curvature. Um, and that curvature will allow this um, radial pore coming out from the silica and, and, and form this, you know, a very interesting structure. So we were able to functionalize these particles with the silanol group, which is OH, um, phosphonate group, amino groups, and carboxylic groups using succinic anhydride. In all four cases, we had no issues in the particle morphology. They all look beautiful. Uh, only in the amino functionalization case, this blue graph here, we, we saw an a, a increase in the particle size. Now, by looking at the TEM, you don't see an increase in the particle size, um, but the particle size increases due to the aggregation in the DLS. Um, and that aggregation is because of the surface, poor surface charge properties of the amino functionalized particles. And this TGA uh, thermogrammetry analysis is to confirm the percentage loading of these particles as well. We loaded exenatide, uh, a peptide, um, a, you know, GLP-1 agonist um, onto these particles, and we were able to achieve about 40% of by weight loading um, compared to the MCM-41, which has only got about 20% loading capacity. Um, we found that the loading was only achieved at pH 5, which is also an isoelectric point of the um, point of the peptide, um, and, and that's um, really important to understand that when uh, peptides um, are at the isoelectric point, the surface charge is neutral, and that neutral charge allows um, uh, the loading of those peptides into those silicon nanoparticles quite easily. We picked up this um, uh, phosphonate and functionalized particles because we wanted to coat kytosan on it. So uh, the left-hand side image is the phosphonate and functionalized dendritic silica particles, um, and we coated them with the kytosan. As you can see, they become denser, darker. Um, normally, when you coat, um, um, you only see the polymeric structure, but here the advantage is because the pores are so absorptive, it sort of absorbs everything. Um, and, and this darkness comes from this um, coating of the kytosan. So the coating does not only happen on the surface here, the coating also happens on the inside pores or surface. So that's why the pores are also blocked. Um, here is a, a final result for this paper. Um, we used, um, with the help of Professor Bruno Sarmento in the University of Porto, uh, we were able to um, improve the permeability, not, not only in the CACO2 model, but also the triple co-culture model, which also showed that the kytosan loaded particles had a better permeability. So last thing I want to talk about is something that we've started working on with this cytokine delivery. Now, this is interleukin 22 as an interesting cytokine that has receptors in the skin, um, respiratory, um, um, lungs, um, um, fibroblast, um, intestinal epithelium, hepatocytes, and pancreatic cells. Um, now, increased production, um, so um, my, one of my collaborators worked with interleukin-22 and they have shown that interleukin-22 is um, able to produce um, very high quality insulin when the beta cell function um, uh, is a problem, so in the diabetic patients. Um, and uh, it also enhanced the protection of the mucus producing cells and elevate the mucus production, so it has implications in the IBD. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to see if we can improve some of the properties of the alpha interleukin-22. 
The challenges of the interleukin-22 are very similar to any protein or peptide, uh, well, any protein. Um, so our stability is a problem, permeability is a problem, off-target effect is a problem. And all of those challenges we went to um, see if we can use silica particles to overcome those challenges. So the first challenge was the permeability. So we were able to load the interleukin-22 with 100% um, loading efficiency into silica particles quite easily. Uh, we were able to permeate some of those um, from A to B. However, if you look at the apical chamber, uh, the IL-22 loaded nanoparticle, which is your silica particles, um, actually stabilized the interleukin-22 for up to 24 hours. Whereas the only IL-22 was sort of percentage was decreased, so it started to de you know, degrade. Um, so we are investigating what's happening there, but that's certainly something interesting that we found. Then we used um, LS147T cells, uh, luciferase cells, um, to look at the STAT3 phosphorylation induced by IL-22. Uh, for the first 24 hours, the results between R22 and R22 nanoparticle look very similar. But after that, you know, interleukin uh, the loaded interleukin 22 loaded nanoparticle performed better because after 24 hours, you know, um, the release of the R22 from the nanoparticle was still probably happening, and the cell was still producing the STAT3. So that was really good. Then we used again DSS model to test um, whether locally delivered IL-22 can induce the uh, anti-inflammatory activity and whether the nanoparticle loaded IL-22 will have any impact on that. So DSS treatment for five days and from day four to day 10, we gave uh, rectal delivery of IL-22. And then that rectally delivered IL-22 was also compared with the positive control where we had uh, IP IL-22 given uh, without nanoparticles. So one other interesting um, thing that we observed is that uh, compared to the blank, the IL-22 rectally given nanoparticles decreased um, the colon weight to, weight to length ratio. Now, that is very important um, in assessing the inflammation. Uh, and then what we wanted to see is, okay, what happens at the molecular level? So the molecular level uh, interleukin-10 was up by IL-22. That shows that the inflammation... Um, um, uh, was there and then as an anti-inflammatory cytokine, the IL-10 production was increased. And that was also accompanied by the interleukin-22 binding protein increase, which sort of told us that the IL-22 that was delivered via nanoparticle was actually bound to the receptor. This is, um, this is not a PK, actually. This is just a one-point analysis of the blood um, where we looked at the uh, any interleukin-22 in the blood after 24 hours because our ethics protocol did not allow us to take lots of time points because the colitis um, mice are very weak and uh, that can lead to ethical issues. Um, but at the 24-hour time point, the IP-injected nanoparticles, we saw some um, R22, but we saw nothing in, in local delivery. So the, finally, the idea is now what we're working on is that delivering these and other proteins and endometry proteins orally using this particle, but then using the um, layer-by-layer -layer coating technology to coat them and then deliver them. I just want to thank, finally, um, my team um, um, who did all of these work um, and the funding bodies, NHMRC, MATER, um, and and. I uh, just wanted to remind everyone that um, as part of my other role um, as the president of the CRS, um, we have a CRS annual conference uh, on 23rd November. Professor Justin Haynes, who is the professor in John Hopkins University, is going to be a plenary speaker. So if you want to register, uh, the abstract submission, unfortunately, is closed, but um, the registration is still free. Um, until the last day. So please go to the website um, crsaustralia.org and register if you want to listen to those talks. Um, thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions. That you guys may have. Yeah, thank, thank you, Professor Arvind. Now, if there are any questions, uh, if anybody want to ask anything. Uh, Professor Popert, uh, this is Anirudh here. Um, excellent talk. Uh, 
I just have one uh, kind of doubt, uh, not exactly doubt, one query. Uh, have you studied the pathway of absorption of these silicon nanoparticles? We have. So um, um, we um, so there are a couple of things. So silicon nanoparticles um, um, are, are absorbed um, through a couple of routes. Okay, and one of the ways they're absorbed is um, opening the tie junction. So silicon nanoparticles are kind of permeation enhancer. So it sort of opens the tie junction transiently for depending upon the dose, and then um, it sort of goes through there. If the silica particles are not um, um, if the dose is not enough to have that effect, silica actually degrades into the silicic acid, which is just going to come out in the urine. So the pathway of the degradation is quite, um, quite, quite simple there. Um, the other pathway is that um, it is due to the size, they are also taken up by M cells. So they go through that system where they're taken up by M cells and then go to the bloodstream and then you know, degrade um, uh, to silicic acid. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Professor uh, Amit, for sir. yeah. Yes, sir, Yant. You have question? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so, sir, thank you so much for your presentation. My friend was also working under your lab, Bhal Chandramore, last year. He was yes. already told many things about the silica nanoparticles. So uh, I just wanted to know uh, the surfactant. What uh, what should be the surfactant property you are choosing according to? that uh, they can form uh, uh, as those self-assembling with the silica? So, um, see, surfactant, um, you have a lot of choice. Um, typically, you go for um, your surfactant such as, you know, CTAB or CTAC, but you can also use surfactant such as F127. Um, so, pleuronics have been um, very successful in forming the large pore um, SBA15 type um, of silica particles. Um, and, and and as we all know, pleuronics are um, FD approved and up, up to certain dose. So pleuronics is another surfactant that you can use. So you have endless choices over there. Um, what you're looking for is that um, the surfactant that can form self-assembly relatively quickly. So you don't want a very high concentration of surfactant, uh, but it forms that self-assembly, say, in 20 minutes, 30 minutes, as soon as you dissolve them. Um, so I think that's what you're looking for. Thank you, sir. So thank you, Professor Amit, for giving a talk on the silica nanoparticles and how they could be used for oral delivery. And thank you for okay. sparing your time for the, for the talk. Yeah. No worries. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you for your invitation.